Hi, Maria. Hi, Thomas. Hi, good to see you. How are you? I'm fine. What about you? Good, good. Thank you. I guess we're, we're starting in a, in a minute, right? Yeah, the time has come. <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, we would have never guessed we'd be doing a conference like this, right? Uh, no, like new experience. New experience, for sure. New learning experience, that's for sure. Yeah. Uh, looks like we have quite a lot of people already. Well, what should we uh, do? Should we wait? Well, I, I think uh, we need to check uh, whether all of the participants are here, and after that we can say a few introductory words and start. Mm -hmm. Sure, sure. So how do we know if everybody's here already? Yeah. So, uh, dear participants, we want to, to check whether all of you here. So I see that uh, Professor Yurchik is here. Uh, Daniel Kabana, uh, are you here? Daniel? Um, yes, I'm here. I'm great. Uh, next in the program, we have uh, Sihar Emilianova. Are you here? Yes, I am. Great. Uh, so the next one, I think I am. And after that, uh, Kate. Kate, are you here? Uh, yes, yes, yeah, I am here. Great. So, uh, well, as we are all here, I think we can start. And uh, well, on behalf of the organizing committee, uh, we, uh, we are happy to welcome you on our online session. As you can see, the, the title of the session is Multiculturalism and Acculturation. However, we will call them a bit more wide scope of topics. Mm -hmm. And uh, well, Professor Thomas Jurczyk will open our session with a uh, very up-to-date and very relevant report to our situation. So, please. Thank you. Sure, thank you. Yes, it is, it's a quite a diverse range of topics that we'll be talking about today, uh, from mental health to acculturation. So I'm really looking forward to um, uh, hearing all the, the, the presentations. So the first one is going to be a little different from, from some of the others, because uh, I'll be talking about the uh, pandemic itself and some of the uh, mental health implications and practice implications. I'm going to try to actually, because uh, I updated my, my slides, I want to see if I can share my screen with you. If I get it to work, give me a few moments. Okay, can everybody see my screen? Hopefully. Uh, Maria, can you see my screen? Yes. Maria? Yes. Yes. Yeah. yes. Okay. Okay. Great. Okay. Sorry. So I'm just making sure I'm not. I'm fairly new to MS team. So, so I'll be talking about practice implications of the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, will be. It'll be a small report from mental health professionals uh, from four different countries. Um, this is actually based on a uh, small paper that we put together, um, uh, my co-authors and I. We had uh, two weeks pretty much to put this together. Uh, there was a call for papers on uh, the mental health implications of COVID-19. I've been thinking about this for some time and I thought, okay, let's, let's try to put something together quickly. And uh, well, we, we did our best. So it's just, this is not an impressive report. It's, it's a small qualitative survey. Um, and I'll see what uh, what we can uh, what I can give you out of this. I'm getting some sort of um, report saying that there's bad network quality, so I'm hoping people can hear me. Uh, okay, uh, Maria, please let me know if uh, you can't hear me if there are there any problems. Okay, thanks. So mm -hmm. this is the outline. So we'll be talking a little bit about COVID-19 more generally and the effects of quarantines and lockdowns. And uh, we'll also talk uh, a little bit about how uh, the pandemic affected different uh, mental health uh, services in, in various countries and in terms of what we also learned and uh, future recommendations. Uh, just uh, a quick reality check on quarantines. Um, uh, I really didn't know much about quarantines until uh, just a few weeks ago, 
But uh, this is this is a, a reality check here. Just this quote: uh, "Awful quarantines involve involve only very few people, or a, a small area, or maybe a ship or an airplane. It's very rare that you actually have quarantines uh, where entire cities, communities. In this case, we have lockdowns of countries uh, take place, and this is unprecedented. We've never actually seen this before on such a mass level." Um, um, Benny, so basically novel virus we're, de we're dealing with, and this is a novel response as well. So COVID-19, I'm not going to go into all the details, but uh, as you know, it's, it was discovered in Wuhan originally uh, it, back in December in China, but it's spread to many countries, about 210 countries and counting. And one of the concerns is that we don't have immunity to uh, this virus, right? So uh, unlike the seasonal flu where, you know, people get it, uh, you know, several times in their lifetimes, so you sort of have some level of immunity because each virus is somewhat similar to the previous one. And uh, but it, in terms of this virus, um, it did uh, jump the species barrier. We came from bats and we pretty much have no immunity against it. There are several epicenters, as you've probably heard in the news, uh, New York, uh, northern Italy, um, uh, Spain as well. And what's been quite uh, dramatic, uh, as you've seen, is that a number of emergency departments and intensive care units have been overwhelmed by this uh, situation. As a result, uh, there have been full lockdowns as well as mass quarantines to what they call to flatten the curve. So the idea is to spread out the cases over a longer period of time. So as you see in the diagram on your top right. Um, and uh, this is like a pretty much a global effort. I mean, it's uh, incredible. By April, more than half of the world's population, so about 4 billion people, uh, were in lockdown. Um, and of course, this isn't without its consequences. It has also led to massive levels of global unemployment, uh, about 7 million people in the U.S., um, and uh, Russian numbers are coming in as well. So there's a, a risk, very much of a risk of a worldwide economic depression. Um, of course, not all services have been affected in the same way. Uh, some industries have in fact maybe even benefited, including Zoom, Microsoft Teams, the IT industry, and uh, many others as well. Research and development on the vaccine. So uh, very quickly, what do we know about COVID-19? Uh, it was uh, it's caused by the SARS-CoV-2 virus, which is related to the uh, original SARS virus that was detected back in 2003, 2004. You might remember that epidemic. I'm going to go into the details, but basically, as you see in the diagram, uh, the virus attaches itself to ACE2 receptors on uh, the, the cell membranes uh, of cells often found in the lungs uh, as well as um, in the gastrointestinal tract and the heart. So that's one of the reasons why if people have pre-existing conditions, this can be a quite, quite a dangerous situation for them. Um, and uh, many people actually don't have any symptoms. However, maybe about 30% or more people who contract the virus show no symptoms. Others have mild symptoms similar to the flu, which is a fever cough. And it can range to severe pneumonia and uh, death in a small proportion of cases. Now, this estimate has been changing rapidly as we learn more about the virus. People thought initially it was around three to four percent. At the moment, estimates are around 0.5 percent. To put that into perspective, the flu is also extremely dangerous, uh, but it's probably around 0.1 percent. Who knows? Maybe it'll drop down to what uh, what it is with the flu. Uh, in terms of uh, deaths, uh, about 170,000 deaths worldwide. Um, and again, in terms of uh, putting that into perspective, keeping in mind that people die of the influenza uh, each year uh, from uh, ranging from about 290 to about 650,000 deaths worldwide. So uh, that's a lot of uh, 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 deaths associated with the flu as well. In terms of who's at risk, so unlike with the flu, a lot of younger people are at, at high risk of the flu and the elderly. In this case, with COVID-19, we see more the elderly being at, at risk. And as I mentioned, people with chronic uh, respiratory problems, with asthma, uh, with uh, heart problems, uh, given the, me the mechanisms of the virus, are at greatest uh, risk. So. A lot of unknowns associated uh, with this virus, as I mentioned, and this has led to uh, some of these controversial measures that are being taken. 
and they have not been without their controversy. Um, I'm actually encouraging you, by the way, you might see on the bottom right of the screen, I also sent out a link to you uh, on a survey and a little mini quiz that you can take. I'm just sort of interested in people's opinions on the uh, uh, pandemic. And you can, you can actually uh, click on the link um, and give me your opinion in terms of what you think about the, the quarantine, what are your thoughts are. There's no right or wrong answers, just sort of uh, interesting for us to get your perspective. I did this with my class as well just the other day. Um, so, uh, so some of the quotes you see uh, are suggesting that, um, you know, it, it, what we're having right now, the mass quarantines, um, it's not an evidence-based practice, but it is there to try to curb the pandemic, to try to control it. Now, not every country ha has been involved in, in the same sort of intervention. In fact, there's some countries one of the co-authors is in Sweden, actually, uh, Karina, you may know her, uh, she's a PhD student, and there they don't have any um, uh, lockdowns. Uh, they have restricted gatherings, but uh, no lockdowns there. So it'll be very interesting to see once this pandemic is over to look at some of the, the differences in infection rates and uh, mortality rates between countries. Um, uh, quite a uh, challenging situation. One of the things that we're getting to know about the unknowns, the basic reproductive number, you may have heard of this in the news, for the flu it's about one or two. So if, if somebody has an infection with the flu, about one or two people, other people are infected. When it comes to COVID-19, uh, there's an average of about two to three people that might get infected with uh, one person being infected. They might spread to two or three other people. Uh, there's some estimates suggesting it might be as high as maybe even six people. So there's a lot of, um, in terms of the, the, the juggling uh, mathematically, uh, there's a lot of uh, uncertainty at the moment. I think that's fueling a lot of the anxiety. Also, as I mentioned, the case fatality rate uh, was probably overestimated early on because we just didn't have a clear sense of the number of cases. Now they're doing community-wide studies, and we're actually noticing that this uh, disease is actually much more common than we thought. I mean, in a recent community study in the U.S., they found something like 2.5% of the population was, was infected, which is much more, something like 50 times more than people actually thought uh, in terms of the, um, the spread of the virus. So as the number of cases are increasing, uh, the denominator, as you see, is increasing. So therefore, the case fatality rate is constantly uh, decreasing as well. But it is still concerning, obviously. We still don't know that much about the, the illness. Um, and it's also unclear whether it has a seasonal pattern. So as with the flu, uh, you tend to have high rates in the winter and low in the summer. Okay. Uh, another phenomenon that we're dealing with is the infodemic, right? So the rapid spread of information, disinformation about the, the virus itself. We didn't have access to social media to the same extent back in 2009, right? When we had uh, the um, H1N1 uh, uh, pandemic. So this is quite a, a novel situation as well. Uh, I'm just going to quickly, as I've been getting some messages from my RA very quickly. Uh, uh, yes. I did. Yeah, so I posted the, the link in the chat. She's telling me to, for you guys to do it if, you, if you're interested. Um, quickly, uh, obviously, I'm not a virologist, uh, and a lot of emerging research, as you can imagine, given the, age, the early stages of the diseases, has been on epidemiology, tracing the illness, treating it, understanding the mechanisms, the symptoms, but there's much less focus on protracted effects of the quarantine, right? So, um, I'm uh, very much interested, and uh, I'm sure many of you are as well, as a social psychologist, in the effects of isolation. Of the, the quarantine uh, obviously has effects on isolation, the lack of social support, as well as socioeconomic issues that are coming about. And all of these uh, variables... Thomas, as we sorry for interrupting yeah. you. Three minutes left. Three minutes left. Oh, yeah. gosh. Okay. So let me move on very quickly. So many already very vulnerable patients uh, uh, are also experiencing anxiety, depression, physical symptoms, as you can imagine, as a result of the illness. So this is a really a small qualitative report that we did. I can send it around later, but we're basically interested in how mental health services have been affected uh, by the pandemic and by the quarantines and some of the lessons that we've learned as well as recommendations for future quantitative research. So it's just a small report. You'll see some of the affiliations of the, the, the therapists, my co-authors involved. Um, 
what we discovered uh, in Western countries is that the, a lot of services have been deemed essential versus non-essential. So there are clear lists for these. Where do psychologists fall? Well, they're considered to be under the category of essential services in Western countries, at least. In Russia, it's a little less clear. Um, so we, we did this survey in Japan and in, uh, in a couple of authors in Russia and Australia and Canada. So I'm a Canadian trained clinical psychologist. I have some contacts in, in some of those places. Now, many uh, psychotherapists, clinical psychologists went online. Those that couldn't go online ended up having to wear personal protective equipment. This is PPE equipment, as you see in the pictures. As you can imagine, this might have quite an effect on the therapeutic relationship if you're meeting your patient in this sort of equipment. Other uh, types of uh, interventions were reduced, such as things such as cognitive assessments, where you actually have to share testing materials with your patient. And that has been reduced due to fear, fears of infection, as well as things such as you might come across a massage therapy actually being banned in many countries due to uh, some of the concerns associated with infection. So these are the uh, questions that I sent my co-authors. So very short qualitative survey. So how did the pandemic affect your clinical practice? Um, and uh, what sort of symptoms are people reporting? Uh, people were reporting increased anxiety, depressive symptoms, as you can imagine. People were relapsing as well in terms of uh, due to issues of alcohol dependence. We're seeing more paranoia and psychotic patients. People with eating disorders, also a very interesting group. I wish I had more time for this, uh, but they've also been limited in terms of exercise, right? So a lot of people uh, exercise excessively when they have anorexia nervosa. They can't, right, in their homes if they've been quarantined. Uh, similarly, people are going now on Skype to do therapy, right? So clinicians are meeting people with body image concerns. And uh, a lot of people are uncomfortable seeing themselves on camera as they interact with their therapist. And as well, uh, people with contamination concerns, so people with obsessive compulsive disorder might have aggravated symptoms as well. Not everyone's been affected, though. I know I'm running out of time very quickly, just you know, one or, one or two minutes. Uh, some people actually with social anxiety issues are reporting feeling less stress in this situation because there is less opportunity for social interaction. You can also imagine that some people with more introverted traits uh, who don't need to go out as much perhaps aren't affected in the same way in terms of the pandemic in, uh, affecting their mental health and worry. So it, it's a really a mixed bag. We've also seen a lot of patients being very stoic and very resilient, realizing that they're in a better situation than some of their peers who may have lost significant income, who have significant distress in their families. Um, uh, there's also been cases of uh, domestic abuse as well. Uh, I should mention, especially when you're putting people together in quarantine in the same home, if they have some pre-existing relationship challenges, that can be a problem as well. We have noticed overall that clinicians are uh, surprisingly uh, becoming adept at using telemental health. A lot of us haven't been trained in using telemental health, but people are getting better at it. And there are numerous studies out now over the last few years showing that telemental health is about as effective as regular counseling for psychiatric issues such as anxiety and depression. There's a lot of studies on telemental health and how effective it is. Uh, of course, there are also inconveniences being aligned right, in terms of privacy issues, uh, security issues, and so on. Um, there have been cross-country differences that are also very interesting to notice. For example, in Australia, many patients actually have access to Medicare, so psych psychotherapy is covered by Medicare. So a lot of uh, clients are able to connect with their therapist and be reimbursed 80% for their sessions or more. Um, uh, teleconferencing has also been uh, used all over the world. In Russia, it's also been used effectively. Some of the issues with Russia, Russia though, unfortunately, because uh, individuals are not being reimbursed to the same extent uh, by the government, uh, they obviously have less access to uh, mental health services as a result. Um, also greater difficulty finding a private place, right? In Japan and Russia, apartments are a little smaller than in Australia and Canada, where people might have access to a house in their own room. So that also is a, is a complication that we've been noticing. Lessons learned, we definitely need to be able to move much more quickly towards telemental health. We also need to educate our clients 
on how to use telemental health. There are a lot of elderly clients who don't know how to use it, for example. So in the next time we have a pandemic, we need to be able to react quickly, as well as have increased access to self-help as well as educational resources that can help us in engaging with our clients. Self-care recommendations, some things that people came up with, definitely really critical, get that social support, even though some people don't like the term social distancing, they call it physical distancing, still get that social support, connect with people, get some moderate exercise if you can, do jumping jacks in your apartment, you need to uh, get your blood circulating because there's a lot of uh, research showing that isolation has a negative impact on cardiovascular health. Keep a daily routine, create a new one if you can, and be realistic, right? recognize that this is a temporary situation so we can probably foster hope. So thank you very much for listening. This is just a summary of uh, what I talked about. Um, uh, we can also talk about this further in the um, uh, discussion period after uh, the other presentations. Um, so that's it for me. Um, thank you for, uh, for listening in and maybe you had a chance to complete the survey. Uh, I'm also now, I, I'm aware that actually my, my, one of my students is probably online now, that Daniel Cavanaugh, who also has a very interesting uh, presentation to share with, uh, with the group. Thank you very much. Uh, Maria? Uh, thank you, Thomas. Uh, yeah, now it's time for Daniel. But uh, before that, I want to remind, remind the participants, maybe we have some newcomers, that the discussion section would be uh, at the end of uh, online session after all the presentations. Thank you. So, Daniel, please, you can start. Daniel, are you online? Yes, can you hear me now? Uh, yeah. Yes, yes. Okay, Great, wonderful. thank you. Okay, um, so thank you, uh, Maria, and thank you, Thomas, for the introduction. Um, I guess when hearing this next presentation, you might like to consider, given the global pandemic, um, what are the things that are affecting people's level of mental health? Uh, and this might be a helpful way to think about uh, my presentation and what I'm discussing, which is primarily mental health literacy. So uh, essentially, as we know, uh, mental health um, is a worldwide issue. Um, it's something that affects um, all individuals and societies differently. Uh, and one of the supposed reasons why people have or cultures have different prevalence of mental health disorders is due to their mental health literacy. So what we mean by that uh, is a term that simply describes all the values, knowledge, beliefs, attitudes that people have towards mental health. So it could be their ability to recognize disorders, it could be their intentions to seek help, um, it could be their levels of stigma. These all affect whether or not someone will be able to um, effectively seek help uh, and benefit from that treatment. Uh, as mental health literacy started in the West, um, you can imagine that this is primarily researched in the West. However, um, the findings of the populations in the West uh, usually find that in compared to non-Western populations, uh, Western populations are better able to recognize mental disorders uh, and they have a better medical knowledge of those men mental disorders. So um, they acknowledge that pharmaceuticals and uh, um, psychotherapy will be effective in treating this disorder. Um, they'll have less stigma. Um, they basically won't see it as, as negatively um, as those in um, non-Western countries. I'm going to come back a few times to the recognition of disorders. So basically, can you identify the symptoms of the disorders? Um, because this is such a necessary first step in actually seeking help and benefiting from that treatment. If you can recognize the symptoms, both in yourself and in others, you can encourage them to get help and you can seek help quicker yourself. So um, I did a cross-cultural comparison between Australia and Russia, focusing on young people. Uh, this was largely a convenient sample um, as an Australian myself uh, and uh, living in Russia at the time. Uh, this uh, research was uh, prevalent because I uh, was a teacher in both Russia and in Australia, so I had access to um, primarily young people um, in the work that I was doing. So some reasons that I expected some differences um, just by doing this cross-cultural sample, um, Russia as non-Western um, had certain differences. Um, one um, was in terms of their um, valuation of emotions. So um, is that uh, a age-old expression that um, 
the one thing I fear is to not be worthy of my suffering, which is uh, something in, in Russian uh, by one of my favorite Russian authors. Um, and this this implies that uh, suffering is something that is valued, um, but not just suffering, but also negative emotions. Um, it could be anger, frustration, sadness. Um, this is in direct contrast to um, the Anglosphere, so Australia, America, where only positive emotions tend to be valued, um, particularly in Australia. Um, if you are happy, you're successful. Um, and if you show an indication of sadness or not being happy, um, then uh, it's considered a failure and you can actually be punished in a social but subtle way. So there's a very difference in terms of the uh, evaluation of emotions. Uh, and then the second thing um, is Australia is a very high trust society, which means beyond their immediate family and close friends, they are willing and able to talk about issues of significance and of um, inner security um, that affect them. So things that we would usually consider quite private, Australians are quite able to talk about these things with the psychologist in the hope of um, improving their mental health. This is in direct contrast um, to Russians where there was um, uh, serious issues with um, the state using mental health professionals, particularly psychiatrists, to um, basically um, affect political dissidents um, or basically to um, get, get rid of them so that uh, it could benefit the state. And this basically meant that um, there is very little trust in um, Russian mental health services, particularly around the issues of confidentiality and privacy. So um, that, that psychologist or psychiatrist using your personal information and, and then maybe uh, telling your employers, for example. So um, with this um, information, I had uh, several hypotheses. Um, they were largely um, at a broad level. Uh, they were about Australia having a higher level of mental health literacy. So being able to recognize the disorders better, being more likely to seek help, um, having less stigma, um, having higher levels of trust um, and basically valuing depression more negatively because depression by its nature includes sadness. I also had some in line with the literature, I had some predictions around um, what participants would do. Um, I did expect that if you die, if you could correctly diagnose depression, you'd be more likely to seek help. Um, and I did assume that um, if you uh, recognize de uh, depression, um, then you think that help that you could be seeking would be more beneficial. So I'll have a look at each of the results of those now. Just in terms of the method methodology, as I said, it was a convenient sample, um, meaning that I essentially on uh, social media websites, we did a snowball sample. Um, the survey was posted. It was encouraged for people who completed the survey to send it on to their friends. Um, we had 259 participants in Russia and 229 in Australia. Um, what the survey involved was a vignette, um, which is a short story of a depressed person so um, who has the symptoms of depression, uh, and then they answered a series of questions about their mental health literacy, um, the level of trust towards other others, um, and their valuation of that disorder. So first hypothesis, um, if you take your attention to the um, front of the page uh, or the top of the page up there, um, it is the actual vignette that was used. So John is a 21 year old who's been feeling unusually sad and miserable. Um, and then you can, um, if you know a bit about depression, you can tell that those are the symptoms of depression um, that follow. So basically after that question, um, after that a vignette, one of the questions, for example, was um, what, if anything is wrong with John, any of those who indicated depression um, were given uh, um, were coded as correct and any of those that did not mention depression were coded as incorrect. Um, there were significant results for this, so the hypothesis um, was supported. Um, uh, Russian youth were less able to identify, correctly identify depression. Uh, and in, in terms of the literature, we did find that participants who recognised depression were more likely to seek help. Um, onto the second hypothesis, Russian youth will be less likely to seek uh, or positively endorse help seeking. Um, so this was actually found the case for um, all of what I call the strangers or the trust in others, um, GP, um, meaning general practitioner, psychologist, a teacher, a spiritual leader. Um, there were quite some, so some quite significant results there um, indicating that there were very dif um, big differences in um, uh, the level of um, uh, endorsement um, that Australian and Russian youth would give. Um, the only thing where this wasn't um, significant for was in close family members and close friends. Um, 
this I will explain a little bit later is likely to do with the level of trust that they have towards um, towards those individuals um, in that Russian youth tend to value their close family members and close friends even more than do Australians. Uh, second part of the hypothesis was that those who recognise depression will be more likely to positively endorse help seeking. Um, so this was found to be the case for both psychologists and psychiatrists. However, it wasn't for general practitioners, um, likely because um, individuals don't always regard doctors as the ones that they would go to for mental problems. Rather, they would go for physical or biological problems. So the third hypothesis um, was around stigma um, and the results uh, for this were significant again in the sense that um, Russian youth were more likely to um, show stigma. Um, there was a range of different measures of stigma that I took, um, these are five of them. Um, so they basically considered uh, that stigma would be, uh, sorry, that depression in Russia was considered not a real medical illness um, and so they could snap out of it Im immediately if they just had a change of mood, for example. Um, it was considered a, a sign of personal weakness um, and Australians were more likely to consider it a sign of a chemical imbalance, showing that scientific understanding. Uh, against or un unlike predictions or ex expectations, though, it wasn't considered to be um, due to an immoral lifestyle, which had been found in previous research with Russians and Americans. So the fourth hypothesis was that Russian youth will rate depression less negatively. This was by far the biggest theoretical jump um, in the in the research piece. This is um, there was a lot of conflicting evidence for um, this and. Uh, and, and against this. <clears throat> so the results weren't significant um, and I'll come back to um, my, my reasoning around why I believe the results were not significant um, and it's not to say that depression may indeed be rated less negatively or more positively. Uh, the final uh, uh, hypothesis was around the levels of trust um, and as predicted um, Russian youth did have lower levels of trust in strangers not just in mental health professionals. This can be partially explained due to the collapse of the Soviet Union, Union in the early 1990s, um, society in disarray. Um, there were a lot of people who were taken advantage of, um, and so there the, um, arguably was less trust in others after this time. Uh, interestingly, as I said, uh, trust was higher for close friends and family members, um, and that was um, found to be significant, um, even though Australia in general seems to be a high trust um, society. So uh, the final hypothesis was around those who trust um, psychologists less um, will be less likely, less likely to endorse them as helpful in treatment. Um, this, I, I guess, should just make sense um, intuitively um, or common sense, we could say. Um, if you trust someone, you're more likely to think they're going to be helpful in treating your problem. Um, and so this was found not just for psychologists, but also um, doctors, spiritual leaders, family, friends, et cetera. So young people really it really matters to young people for you to be able to trust them before you um, think that they will actually help you. So in terms of the discussion, um, uh, as we can see, most of the results were in line with the uh, with the expectations. Um, uh, effectively, uh, Russian youth showed lo lower levels of recognition. They showed lower levels of mental health literacy in terms of stigma um, and in terms of help seeking. So they were um, more likely to endorse seek, uh, dealing with the problem, which is depression in this case, on their own, as opposed to seeking help from others. Okay, and this is in line with um, a lot of the research showing that, that non-Western populations have lower mental health literacy. Uh, in that, in, also in line with the research, um, those who recognised depression were in fact more likely to endorse professional help seeking. Um, and as I said, uh, however, this was not from a doctor um, and it's likely that um, doctors are still not considered as a primary port of call um, for mental health disorders compared to psychologists, which is their area of specialisation. Uh, so I'd like to, um, the, the third and fourth hypothesis I'll, I'll discuss together here. Um, I, I did have some evidence to assume that um, Russian youth would be um, less likely to show stigma um, when indeed um, they did, the results were that they showed more stigma. Um, the reason why this was... Daniel, was sorry for interrupting, three minutes. That's okay, thank you. Um, the reason why I thought this would be the case is based on the assumption that if Russians value sadness, 
sadness is included in our vignette of depression, then they would overall rate depression less negatively. Therefore, if they didn't see, um, or if they are less likely to recognize um, depression as a mental disorder, because one of the symptoms is sadness, which they don't consider is an issue, um, then they won't show stigma towards someone because they don't think that there's actually a problem. The reason why I believe the results were as such that um, they were more likely to show stigma and Russians did not rate depression less negatively um, was simply because of the five symptoms in the vignette, only one related to sadness. So it's questionable, was that one symptom enough in order to actually change the entire evaluation of depression? Um, in this case, it doesn't seem to be the case, although for future research, it would be very interesting to change the vignette. There's no standardized vignette around the world for people to use in these mental health literacy studies, which is a major issue um, of the research. Um, but if there was uh, in future research, different levels of the vignette that had the effective symptoms displayed more clearly, or even um, expressing how they dealt with that, those negative emotions, um, I believe that there would be some sort of difference um, to be found. Uh, and yeah, as expected, um, levels of trust were higher in Australia. Uh, so yeah, those are the conclusions. Overall, uh, Russian youth have um, lower levels of mental health literacy compared to Australian youth. Australians are better at recognizing symptoms, seeking help, um, and understanding the true causes of depression. Um, whereas uh, Russian youth are more likely to endorse dealing with the problem of their own, um, except for perhaps speaking to their family and friends, whereas um, they would not seek help from a mental health professional. Um, we might consider that um, whether or not you think someone will be helpful depends partly um, on whether or not you trust them, as this seems to be an enduring trait for young people. They need to trust the others with whom they're sharing and disclosing this personal information. And as I mentioned before, uh, when mood symptoms of depression are not highlighted in vignette, um, uh, Russians do not rate depression less negatively, although this would be um, worth uh, further research further researching. And that's all. Okay, great. great. Thank you. Thank you, Daniel. Thank you, Thank you so you. much for that interesting presentation. So next is um Gimeliana Vasiher. Oh, right. Thank you. On Turkish immigrants perception of yeah. integration. They're interesting yeah. Yes, I hope everybody can hear me. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Oh no. Sorry, sorry. Just one minute. You can just take control over your presentation because it's already sharing. OK. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yes, my today my topic is um, Turkish immigrants' perception of integration in Russia and uh, specifically the role of religiosity. Uh, after the collapse of Soviet Union, contract-based migration from Turkey to Russia became visible. So that's the why I chose this topic for my master thesis, actually. So the bond between Russia and Turkey is not limited with the... Um, uh, Migrant workers is especially marriage is also another phenomenon between um, Turkish and Russians so in the both country. And the current estimates say that um, many Turkish people, like 1,052 and 500 Turkish people live in Russia, and 25% of these Turkish people live in Moscow. That's why I chose the Moscow. Um, to choose my participants because Moscow has the highest density among all Russian cities. So 
Uh, and there was no study about uh, actually the integration and acculturation process of Turkish immigrants in Russia. So we can move on to research questions. Yes. yes. Yeah. Uh, my actually I really jumped on the data, <laughs> and many times I revised my literature and you know theory and everything. But my first ideas: How is integration perceived and experienced by Turkish immigrants in Moscow? And sub questions. What role does religion play in integration process? Because there are many studies and huge literature about the Turkish immigrants and their integration process and its relation to their religiosity in Europe. So I, I want to make a comparison a little bit at least. So what are the ways of integrating experience by Turkish immigrants, like socioeconomic, cultural, or both? And does a socioeconomic integration lead to cultural integration or not? And what are factors that contribute cultural integration, like as they perceive and experience? What is the role of religiosity if um, in this process? So, yeah. Yeah. Theoretical background, um, I got huge help from Barry, thanks for his works. And for a cultural strategy, it says um, re about the regarding how individuals relate to an ethnic culture of the minority group, uh, group and dominant culture. And in integration, an uh, individual feels a strong sense of identification to both cultures, yeah. Integration is important, but actually I want to know that uh, how they feel, how Turkish immigrants from Muslim majority country to an Orthodox majority country at the end of the day, how they feel themselves, how they um, define themselves, like they feel integrated to the uh, Russian society or they feel more assimilated or separated or marginalized. So I used um, actually uh, to support my ideas, I used many a uh, different author, but, but the main one was the Berry and Boswell, classical dimension of integration. Cultural integration includes the language, respect for basic norms, religion, you know, daily beliefs, uh, daily norms, and um, socioeconomic uh, dimension of integration includes education, welfare system, do they have an equal chance in the labor market, and so on. And Penix also um, gave me a way to think about the inclusion or exclusion, like how Russian integration policies affect them at the end of the day, if they feel it. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, as I say, there's a huge literature about both studies in Muslim co communities in Russia, like conflicts in Chechnya, Russia's domestic Muslim policy, extremist movements in Russia, Russian Muslims, xenophobia, Islamophobia, how they feel th themselves in Russia and so on. But yeah, I skipped that part. But I want to focus on the literature on the integration and religiosity of Turkish immigrants in Europe. There is a huge literature about it. Like, like I choose four of them for this presentation. Yeah, I say like they say that well, the first one say that the Turkish immigrants fail to integrate in Belgium and Austria, Austria. And second, like say us, yeah. Turkish immigrants have strong bond with Turkey, follow values of home country in the sense of religious, and they are not well integrated. And again, third one says uh, religiosity and integration, like, like what degree of integration and religiosity affect each other among second generation. And the result is really interesting. The role of socialization is essential. And if Turkish immigrants less religious, uh, they have higher level of education and higher level of intermarriage with Europeans. And uh, last one, say as uh, Muslim and non-Muslim, non-Muslims in United Kingdom. And the data says that uh, Muslims integrate less and more slowly than Muslims in the UK. Yeah. And yeah, let's move on to my data. Yeah, I, I, 
I have some, of course, selection criteria for the interview participants, like basic ones. I choose first generation Turkish immigrants in, who live in Moscow and both Turkish and Kurdish origin immigrants I have and stayed in Moscow for at least three years, because if we are talking about how they feel themselves, how their integration process is going on, adaptation process is going on, and, and their religiosity is affected, um, at least, I mean, I expect that at least three years they have to live in Moscow, so we can talk about m more. Um, and 18 years and older, of course, after the interviews, I got, in my sample, seven males and six females of, you know, from ages from 22 to 47. Middle class, I mean, I didn't choose middle class, I'm well educated Turkish, but th these people that, that I can get contact because, I mean, in Turkey, and I am a Turkish, I know that people, but yeah, actually, they do not want to talk about with you such special topics you know, their daily lives. It's not easy because we have no such, um, how can I say it, um, research culture, yeah. And they have fears, you know, maybe I can use the data somewhere else and so on. So the people that I can get connected was middle class and well-educated Turkish immigrants at the end of the day. And most of the females are housewife, except one, while the male, males are all employed. And both Sunnis and Alevis, more religious and less religious participants in my sample, I use different social channel to get them, yeah. And methodology part, I uh, can say that it's a total qualitative research design because I wanted to get the advantage of the narrative rich data to reveal process of integration and the role of religiosity on the basis of ground theory. The data transcription from audio records, I did line by line coding and it was really time consuming for me, but yeah, I did. And main themes actually come from after the initial coding. Like, uh, I jumped on the data and I said, we talk about the really general topics, actually no, uh, mm, like, no uh, kind of exact questions. But yeah, after initial coding, some themes come up and like their motivation to come to Russia, process of adaptation, relations with the new environment, like from, like with their colleagues and neighbors and so on. And, and we talk about the differences and similarities in life in Russia and Turkey. Everybody likes to talk about it. Perceptions of successful integration, like who are the successful immigrants for them, they talk about it. Religiosity and practice of Islam in Moscow, how they feel themselves, free, safe, or the otherwise. And in vivo codes <clears throat> to understand participants deeply, like concept and phrases they used, like Russia became a new Europe for me, and one of them said that Russia is an orthodox country, like we can feel the effect of communism, Russia is a multi-ethnic country, we can use halal food facilities, or these people are not exactly Russian, but Georgian and Tatar. So such goals I used, yeah, they used. And in my master thesis, I included these all findings. But today I will talk about some, yeah, I, I have to choose some of them to talk because of time limitations. So let's move on to findings. Yeah, perceptions about Russia and Russian culture. Russia perceived as an orthodox country and Russian as ethnicity for them. When they talk about culture, they generally refer to slow, Slav Russian ethnic culture. They exactly know the difference. Who is the Slav Russian and who is not? And like one of the guy, Mehmet, say that um, I have friends, Georgian and Tatar, but these people are not exactly Russian, but Georgian and Tatar. Even if they are Russian citizens, they, the, they know the difference from the very beginning. And my wife and the other guy, Ahmed, say that my wife is a Russian, but she is Tatar and Muslim. That's why we had no problem with religion in our family. We fast during Ramadan and say that, yeah, Russians do not care about your religion. No one interferes with your 
with your faith in daily life. So in, in this subject, uh, I'm glad we didn't have a problem in an orthodox country. And another perception is that Russia perceived as Europe in the sense of freedom and safety, but they emphasize that Russia is more tolerant toward Muslims. Russia is understood as a multi-ethnic country. Like There are many quotes about it, but I choose one. Mehmet said that uh, my views on Turkey in recent years has cha changed. I went to Algeria and the atmosphere there was a disgrace. That time, Turkey was like a Europe for me. When I came to Russia, this place became a new Europe for me. Yeah. Uh, Seher, sorry to interrupt you. Three minutes left. Oh my God. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Perceptions of integration and the role of religiosity. They said that. Yeah. Marriage and language are important factors that contribute to cultural integration for Turkish immigrants. They said that. Yeah. Language difficulty we have to overcome. It's really integrated to be feel integrated like many Turkish immigrants. And they say that we need to learn the language. Um, we need to know the environment here but yeah they say it. it's it's my failure i i couldn't learn russian and another point is that socioeconomic integration does not necessarily lead to a culture clear cultural integration for turkish immigrants because they say that yeah i came here to work adapted my work environment learned russian my life is quite successful but yeah it's where is the uh, actually cultural integration here because he only um, live in uh, work environment and around them like colleagues and work and like you know a little bit Russian and that's it. Cultural integration is not perceived as absolutely needed for integration to be successful. What is perceived as needed are language skills. Again, if you want to be successful immigrant for, for Turkish immigrants, you have to know first the language. Yeah. And religiosity of Turkish immigrant does not prevent integration. It may even be a bridge to integration because still Russia is perceived as an orthodox country. Uh, but yeah, it's not it's not a problem for them and because because of Russia is actually a multi-confessional and multi-ethnic country. And they say that it's not necessary to change the cultural and religious identity. Uh, but it's important not to live in extreme ways, like I can choose not to cover my head, I can wear my miniskirts, but that doesn't mean I'm not Muslim. My faith is nobody's business. I don't feel any really religious pressure here and so on. The other guy say that I'm a religious Muslim, my wife is a religious Orthodox, but everyone is living according to their faith, so it's not a problem for them. Russia is an orthodox country, but good country for Muslims. Yeah. Um, Turkish immigrants also emphasize that Russia is insightful toward their Muslim communities inside also. Like they, they can, the guy say that, they can clean the mosque streets and take, take security measures for eight prayers. Like even the president of Russia conveys a con congratulatory message for Ramadan and Eid al-Fitr. Yeah, they say that uh, Islam is experienced experience intensely here and freely. Yeah, Russia is a, another guy, Mehmet said that Russia is an Orthodox country, Christian country, but the same time Russia is acting very tolerant toward Muslims. And another guy, Osman, said that I appreciate the Russians. They have a positive attitude toward different religions and ethnic groups. Perhaps this could be the effect of communism and no, no religious pressure here. And as a conclusion, yeah, Turkish immigrants are happy to be integrated in the Russian society. Most of them adopted integration as an, their favorite acculturation strategy. Only two of them experience separation as a result of their personal choices and they say that yeah Russia can include us but we want to live in their own our own ways our own religious and so on they say that yeah it's our cho choice to be separated from the society and socioeconomic integration and cultural integration yeah we, we discussed it uh, they do not have to lead to each 
the other one. And cultural integration is made easier for Turkish immigrants by the fact that Russia accommodates well Muslims. Almost all of them say this. Um, there is a lack of sociability. Russians have lack of curiosity for foreigners. It can be an advantage for, for Turkish immigrants. They say that, yeah, everybody happy, everybody free, nobody care about us. But it can be a disadvantage in the adaptation process because it's going on more slowly in Russia. And um, yeah. Uh, Sihar, sorry, time is up, so please make a general conclusion. Okay. Yeah, in, in Western Europe, religiosity can be perceived as a barrier to cultural integration, to socioeconomic integration, but it's not case for Turkish immigrants in Russia. May even be a bridge to integration because they have like middle class and um, well educated Turkish have really good um, image of Russia in the sense of religion, safety, and freedom. Yeah. Everybody? Yeah, yeah, great. Thank you very much for your presentation. Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, great. Nice, interesting. Dis I'm really looking forward to having a discussion, but I guess we have to save it for the end. Um, and uh, Maria, you're presenting next, correct? Yeah, correct. Okay, great. So, whenever so, you're ready. Yeah, I'm ready. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, one more time. Oh, sorry. Uh, Kate, can you help me? Can you share it one more time? Yes, I do. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so, good afternoon one more time. Uh, the topic of my study was dedicated to uh, the question how Russian students perceive cultural difference and the cultural competence depending on whether they are more creative or less creative. The relevance of the topic lies on the intersection of, uh, I would say, two challenges of contemporary world. Uh, the first one uh, is related to uh, difficulties in stimulating creativity in, organization, in, in educational organizations. And the second one uh, lies in the sphere of intercultural relations and particularly uh, in the question how to adapt to cultural diversity that is becoming more and more uh, pronouncing in modern terms due to educational migration. Uh, the study ground, the theoretical study of grounds include, uh, let's say, several facts. Uh, the first one is that creativity researched here as a sociocultural phenomenon. So we believe uh, it is a trained ability. And the cultural approach to creativity uh, tells us that intercultural contacts uh, actually can um, stimulate creativity because it, it helps to expand our pool of ideas and it helps us to overcome the barriers uh, related to some cultural peculiarities of our own countries. Uh, the second fact is that uh, well, not all intercultural contacts are useful for creativity, but only worse of them, then they do really know how to cope with stress of acculturation. Then we have abilities to adapt. And intercultural competence uh, can be an indicator or I would say even a tool for this adaptation. Uh, one additional moment to mention is that this study is concentrated on small multicultural experience, not on big multicultural experience as it was done in previous studies. That means that we consider like host population, uh, Russian students who are not that much deeply involved in foreign cultures as for example expatriates do. And the second fact is uh, that we work with students and the key issue here is that university can be a good platform for intergroup contacts and it has some potential for developing both competence and creativity. Boom, boom, boom. Next. However, if we want to, uh, to work only with relationship between contacts, competence and creativity, we need to do some kind of big quantitative study, not uh, investigating the perception. Uh, well, actually, the big study was done previously, and there were some empirical, well, some inconsistencies in the results of these studies. Uh, thus, I have found that, for example, among Russian students, 
uh, presence of foreigners in, a, in their study group is associated with creativity growth only then they the Russian students also attend some kind of learning course. So then they get some information how to cope with this, uh, you know, this, this diversity. Uh, the another issue which can be even more important and more interesting to us is that uh, the, not all components of intercultural competence or cross-cultural competence is negative, is, is positively related to creativity. Thus, attitudinal components, so there's a be related there or not to uh, foreigners, uh, really stimulates, can, stimul can stimulate creativity, while uh, behavioral component, in particular, whether to change or not to change and how to change the behavior, is negatively related to creativity. Uh, that evokes several questions. The first one, maybe, uh, the, why, why is it so? Probably that's about specificity and perception of uh, competences which are inside the intercultural competence. Thus, some previous studies shows that individualists and collectivists, for example, perceive uh, changing behavior differently. Individuals believe it's hypocritical to do it, while collectivists sometimes think uh, it's a clever behavior to change it in accordance with situation. Uh, another option is that uh, such a result could be due to limitation of instruments used in previous studies. So uh, as we used uh, questionnaires to measure, for example, change in behavior, we uh, do really measure the intensity of how much do they change? But we don't know what do they mean by changing the behavior. Do they mean a real uh, customization of behavior by foreigners' needs, by the situation, or they need uh, they meant something you know more universal, like being more polite or something like that? That's why uh, this study was done. So the aim of study was identifying patterns in perception of differences and cross-cultural competences among Russian students. And uh, the key assumption was that if it is, uh, not, you know, not the widely spread some kind of universal cultural feature among Russians, there should be some differences in perception uh, of uh, competences needed among more creative and less creative Russian students. So uh, it was qualitative study. Uh, I have done structured interviews with 30 respondents. Uh, respondents were, uh, were chosen from a big sample of previous study. So uh, 15 most creative and 15 least creative respondents who agreed to participate in the interview session uh, they'll constitute the sample. And uh, the answers uh, analyzed using content analysis procedure. Uh, you will see in one, two slides that the results are present not in terms of numbers, how many respondents give this answer, but in terms of how it is widespread among the sample, as it was done in some previous studies. Uh, pam, pam, pam. So here you can see uh, some kind of questions. Of course, the interview was done in Russian, so that's a brief translation. Uh, the questions uh, were formulated on the basis of how intercultural competence and its components were defined and operationalized in previous studies and even the questionnaires. Uh, in reality, the question included several more questions, but uh, as they are not the key uh, on the core of the study, they are not included here. So, to the results, what have they found? Firstly, uh, we have found that uh, well, speaking about just existence of some differences, uh, for less creative students, it's more typical to deny or to decrease importance of differences. So they could say, well, uh, there are no any differences. We are all humans. They tried to uh, explain the reasons for denial. Or they could say, well, there are some differences. However, they are not important as foreign students should not demonstrate them in Russian university. Uh, on the other hand, more creative students, uh, more often, well, it was more typical for them to say that, yeah, there are some differences and we have to accept them. For example, foreigners could be uh, more motivated, they could be more open-minded, uh, all this stuff. Another important, I would say, difference here is that competition was uh, mentioned pretty often. So for less creative students, it was typical to say that, uh, yeah, foreign students are different. They are more motivated. They study more hard. Uh, they are even workaholic. And sometimes it was said in a, you know, such a negative tone, like they work so much, it is even unpleasant with us. It's hard to talk to them because they are talking only about, uh, well, studies. Well, of course, that was not uh, all. 
students that that kind negative and uh, the, the more positive outcomes were found among uh, more creative respondents as well as more creative respondents uh, more more often talked about some kind of cultural differences uh, to be honest the answers were not too much deep so uh, they'll they didn't mention particular psychological features of cultures but still they could mention yeah they're different they have different traditions uh they have different uh, patterns of behavior in general that all was calculated like cultural differences uh pam 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 next speaking about what can help us can help russian students to be successful in uh, intercultural communication uh they'll the results are quite mixed as you see both groups small creative students and less creative students uh they'll place uh, almost at the first time the previous intercultural experience like whether they communicated or not communicated with foreigners whether they have been abroad and all this stuff and the most striking uh, difference was found in whether they really mentioned culture specific factors or not as usual uh, it was about knowledge of some traditions knowledge of some behavior patterns uh, less often it was about behavior uh, pam, pam, pam. There we go. next one knowledge uh, we also have found some differences in uh, how knowledge are perceived like importance of knowledge uh, Sometimes uh, our respondent denied importance of uh, knowledge in in being successful. They told that attitudes are more important. For example, it's not so much important to know about other cultures, but uh, to be ready to to communicate with foreigners. Or they could talk about the behavior, like it is uh, well, it is more important to be polite. It is more important to be uh, active in communication. Uh, however, for uh, more creative respondents, still it was typical to say about some kind of culture specific knowledge. You see, there is a very clear link about whether we perceive existence of difference or not, and whether we uh, place importance of culture specific knowledge or not. Well, next. Next one was about uh, attitudes. Attitudes was measured in terms of uh, readiness to specific actions. So, how to, to what should you be ready? Then you work, then you communicate with foreigners. Then you study these foreigners. And uh, what I I would say I like here is that there was striking difference in the valence of effective components of attitudes. So, uh, less creative students uh, demonstrated more negative emotions. Uh, they told that, well, you should be ready to cope in with your stress. You should be ready with coping with sadness or irritation because there could be some conflicts. While more creative respondents were, let's say, more enthusiastic and provided, uh, demonstrated more positive emotions. Uh, they also told more about benefits, while less negative students told more about threats related to uh, communicating these foreigners. Uh, next, uh, the results about behavior change uh, are the most complicated for interprotein in, the, in, in, in this study. Uh, the key issue here is that uh, the, the, the biggest majority of uh, Russian students told that you don't really need to change your behavior, or if you change it, you, you should use some kind of uh, general pattern. So, you should be more polite, you should be more attentive, you should hear attentively, you should uh, maybe speak slowly and all this stuff. And a pretty small amount of students, well, it's some, sometimes found, but still mentioned culture-specific adaptations, but still they're not really very deep. So that could be something to demonstrate the interest to other cultures, to ask them about other cultures, all this stuff. Uh, coming to the discussion and to conclusions and uh, taking all, all what is found in uh, one slide. Firstly, uh, if we talk about differences, some students still uh, accept them. But if we go to cultural differences, majority of Russian students comes from the idea of denying them or uh, decreasing their importance, not accepting their importance. And that's uh, pretty good in line that this what was found in study of Novikova done in another university on another students. So we, ca we can say about uh, some kind of universal issues here and about ethnocentric level of cultural sensitivity, like 
yeah, they tend to be more ethnocentric. Uh, the next, the second conclusion is about attitude. So both uh, more and less creative students uh, accept importance of being ready to contact. However, the content of uh, to, to what they should be ready is quite different. So uh, less creative students base their attitudes on the need to be prepared to control, to monitor their behavior, to monitor their emotions, uh, and uh, to be more ready to cope in these threats than these benefits. Mm, that that's quite good. Then they they look at uh, another studies because it was found that. Generally, high level of self-monitoring negatively affects creativity. The more they tend to monitor our behavior, the more that distracts our attention and tell. We, we need some autonomy and we need some resources, some space for creativity, and they don't have it in that case. Uh, another issue that is that uh, cultural learning, uh, which is the, the key path to creativity, it happens only when they feel uh, quite safe to explore cultural differences, while uh, university is a rather competitive uh, environment and perception of foreignness as threats leads also to negative attitudes. And the final one is about behavioral patterns. So uh, majority or of both uh, groups respondents uh, focus more on general issues, uh, focus more so, let it say, on color blindedness of the behavior. So uh, they underline the importance to be the same, both with the Russians and the foreigners. Uh, but if they are the same, on the one hand, that means to be polite, but on the other hand, that means that they don't accept and don't see the differences. We don't accept new information and there is no cultural learning. And uh, to conclude, that, low, that leads us to the question of how much adaptive resources we have in order to cope with this diversifying experience and what can they do to to, to help everybody to to uh, well, to be happy to to be productive in the university i think that's it yeah that's it thank you for your attention great thank you very much maria thank you for that um and uh right along um i have some questions about uh yes i'm here first short sound check can you hear okay. me well yeah i can hear you Okay, then I think that I can uh, start. Thank okay, you. hello everyone. My name is Katerina Kodja. I'm a research intern at the, at the Center for Sociocultural Research. And today I'm presenting you this study done under supervision of Professor Lebedeva. And we're gonna look at psychological well-being of Crimean Tatars, who are the indigenous group, uh, minority group of Crimea. And we will look at the role of uh, acculturation strategies and identities for their uh, well-being. Okay, I'm sure that Russian audience is quite familiar with the context and I'm gonna briefly just uh, describe the context for our foreign audience. Uh, here you can see Crimea on the map. It's um, a small place that became part of Russia recently and Crimean Tatars, uh, uh, these are indigenous people of Crimea that constitute 10% of the population. So the total population of Crimea, uh, 2 million people. Why do we look at this uh, group in particular? Because of their massive changes in identity that they had and massive challenges that they experienced in the uh, 20th century. First of all, in 1944, during the Second World War, uh, this ethnic group have been deported, uh, removed from Crimea to Central Asia. They stayed for 50 years in exile and they uh, got permission to return to their homeland in uh, 1989. So after this, they started to return massively back to Crimea. And so for all this period, they live in uh, Crimea. And that was not the end for the challenges for this group. In 2014, uh, Crimea became part of Russian Federation, as you know, and this created uh, whole challenges for psychological well-being of all ethnic groups uh, living in Crimea for majority Russians, for different minority groups, but for minority, of course, it's more difficult. So in this study, we're going to look at the psychological well-being of Crimean Tatars. 
Uh, here's our research question. Uh, the role of, social, of identities and uh, acculturation strategies for psychological well-being of two generations of Crimean Tatars. And uh, briefly, the theoretical background. Uh, we're going to look at social identity theory because people uh, behave to multiple ethnic groups, therefore they have uh, multiple identities, ethnic, national, place, that not, do not necessarily always match good with each other. Secondly, we're going to take uh, Barry's acculturation model uh, we skip marginalization strategy from this study because it's not very relevant to our sample. And we're going to look at only three strategies, keeping in mind that integration strategy, uh, as according to the studies, is known to be the best strategy for psychological well-being. And as for the well-being itself, we're going to look at self-esteem and life satisfaction. Uh, I say two generations, but mostly I mean not families, generations, but uh, two age groups. And we divide our sample into age groups, and the borderline for the vision is uh, 35 years old. Why? Because, as I told before, uh, the permission to return was issued in 1989, so people who were born in 1983, 84, and before uh, were mostly socialized, not in Crimea, but in Central Asia, and they were at least uh, undergoing some educational institutions there, or at least spent some reasonably well-remembered childhood years. And the younger group, uh, 17 to 34 years old, were either born or in Crimea or came to Crimea while being, being very small. Uh, you see that our second group, older one, is more balanced in terms of gender, which uh, first group is not very. Okay, these are the measures that we used, mostly from Mirix subscales. We also had place identity scale and uh, life satisfaction and uh, self-esteem scale. Briefly, uh, the means and uh, statistics. Uh, our scales reached uh, rather satisfactory levels of alpha, and here I'm showing only young group. Uh, what is important here that generally they have a reasonably high level of self-esteem and life satisfaction. Also, simulation is the least preferred strategy, and you see that national identity is quite low. And this same thing is also relevant to the adult group. National identity is quite low, assimilation is low, but high level of self-esteem and life satisfaction. We are not making any conclusions about national identity yet. Uh, Probably the identity formation process is still ongoing and we will see some high level of national identity later, but only repetitive observations can help us to do so. Okay, and then we built the models uh, in SAM to examine the relationship between these uh, identity strategies and life satisfaction and self-esteem. And you see that for integration model, what is more important here that Ethnic identity is a significant positive predictor for both life satisfaction and self-esteem for young group and uh, self-esteem for old group. And also what is important that integration is a positive predictor for both components of uh, psychological well-being for adult group only. And if we go to separation model, you see that uh, Again, ethnic identity is a significant positive predictor of life satisfaction and self-esteem for, uh, for young group and self-esteem for adult group only. And separation is a positive predictor of life satisfaction for young group, as well as separation doesn't play any role for adult group at all here. Assimilation model is not very informative, except that ethnic identity, again, is a positive predictor of both components of uh, psychological well-being for this ethnic group. Okay, these are briefly just correlations that mostly just support the same pattern that we had. This is the young group and uh, separation strategy here is positive predictor, uh, positively related with life satisfaction and self-esteem. And for old group, you see that integration strategy plays positive role for well-being. These are results briefly what we found, just uh, main results that separation positively predicts life satisfaction for young group of uh, Crimean Tatars and integration predicts life satisfaction and self-esteem for old group. And identities, here's some consistency that ethnic identity positively predicts self-esteem for both groups and life satisfaction for young group only. 
And if we proceed to result, uh, to discussion section, uh, I suggest you to look at the features of the context that we examine here and to try to make some story of it. Of, of it. Uh, first of all, uh, regarding minority identity, why do we have these results for Crimean Tatars that ethnic identity seems to be a very stable, very fundamental predictor, source for psychological well-being of this group, we have to look at the historical background of this group. All this, all this massive challenge, challenges that they had in 20th century, they managed to preserve their identity uh, during 50 years in exile. They managed to return to Crimea and they managed to recover and to get some extent of economic success in comparison to Russians. So while studying uh, identities of ethnic groups, we should always take this into account, uh, these aspects of minority identity formation. Secondly, in terms of generation differences that we examined here, this is the result uh, as we as social researchers are able to observe the results of huge social experiment, which is Soviet Union and, and its collapse that followed further and we can see here that these uh, facts sometimes split the generations within one ethnic group in their view to, towards uh, some aspects of reality. And somehow at the same time, they unite different, aspect, uh, different uh, ethnic groups across post-Soviet space. So uh, I think that I'm sure that uh, research in this post-Soviet space are very thought-provoking and have very good potential because uh, Crimean Tatars, all the generations they were raised in as Soviet people, let's say, they underwent social education system. That's why coping with this new reality of being Crimean citizens, for them, uh, integration plays more important role. And uh, for younger group who were raised as citizens of Ukraine and they underwent a Ukrainian education system that was quite, uh, um, Quite successful, I would say, in terms of raising patriotism and raising these ties with the state. And it, it, I'm saying this from my personal experience. That's why for them, separation here as a minority might be the better strategy for psychological well being. So, uh, and I'm moving to my third point transition period, uh, just to highlight that Crimea now is a very a uh, very unique uh, context to examine how identity strategies and overall uh, minority maj majority relationship in transition develop. Because uh, this context gives us opportunity for repetitive observations and uh, probably we can see some shifts in identities, some shifts in strategies, some shifts in uh, uh, psychological well-being because uh, because just we have uh, opportunity to examine th this uh, uh, this phenomena uh, within some time slots. Okay, looks like uh, that's all that I wanted to say, and um, I guess that we can proceed to the general discussion session now. Thomas. Great, thank you, thank you very much, Kate. Um, we actually already have uh, a number of, of questions in the meeting chat. Um, uh, maybe uh, I could read out some of them. Um, please uh, feel free to type in specific questions in the meeting chat and I can I can read them out or if you'd like to say them out loud, you're welcome to as well if you turn your microphones on. Uh, Maria, how much time do we have for the discussion? Uh, well, we have it. at least we have 15 minutes. Oh, okay. 15 minutes then, great. Okay, so how about I start reading uh, some of the questions then that I see here. Uh, Jana specified, we want to start with you, Kate, since uh, you just presented on the Crimean Tatars. Um, she asked about, was the issue of strategies and identity culturation from 1990 to 2014 considered? Uh, what are the differences between these strategies? I think you touched on that a little bit, but maybe you could expand. Hey, did you hear me say that or? Yes. Hey, are you there? Yes, I, I hear you. Oh, yes. Yeah. Sorry, yeah, there's just some background uh, noise there. Did you hear the, the question? Do you want me to repeat it again? Uh, could you please repeat again? 
Yes. Was the issue of strategies and identity acculturation from 1990 to 2014 considered? I think you touched on that a little bit, but I think uh, uh, they want you to expand on that. What are the differences between these strategies? Uh, this is regarding the Crimean Tatars. Okay, as for the uh, identities, first of all, in 1990s, uh, there was no need to develop a national identity in Russian. Uh, me as a Russian citizen. So Crimean Tatars were citizens of Ukraine and they managed to develop a relatively strong uh, national Ukrainian identity in this time. So uh, in 2014, they had to, in one day as other Crimean uh, residents, to make a switch towards new national identity. And this process for them is a little bit more slower than for Russians, but it's still ongoing. And in terms of strategies, uh, I think it hasn't been measured before, but what I can assume that uh, integration, it was the strategy that uh, Crimean Tatars used not only when they came back to Ukraine, but on, also when they were in exile in Central Asia. And this strategy, integrating, getting higher education, building a huge network of contacts, this what uh, helped them to survive economically in Central Asia, so it was a successful strategy for them. And after coming back, that was what they also used uh, in new reality. And what we examine here about separation for young people, this is just the particular feature of the context for this time period that we examine right now. This represents the difference in attitude of, of two generations towards the state that they lost, Ukraine, and towards the state that they got. So I, I hope I uh, managed to provide answer to your question. Okay, okay great. Thank you for that. Um, uh, there's also a related question. Um, and maybe you could answer that briefly. And I did, uh, to what extent did the study address the history of the Crimean Tatars during the Great Patriotic War? Because you did mention that, you know, the deportation, which would have been a... Um, uh, trauma for that generation. Mm -hmm. Could you maybe expand on that a little bit? Uh, in this study, we didn't uh, we didn't put any historical uh, goals uh, as examining the history of Tatars during the war. As you know, many many Crimean Tatars were in the war at that time. Some of uh, very famous, like uh, Amit Khan Sultan, who was a famous pilot, and they had to come back after the war, not to Crimea, but already to Central Asia, which was something who, that increased the trauma dramatically. I don't address this in the study. I address this topic a little bit uh, in my qualitative part of the study that I don't show here, because when it comes to deportation period, you never can avoid touching uh, the Crimean Tatars' contribution to the war. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. If you, probably the question touched the second part of that story, uh, their role not as, uh, uh, not as uh, so soldiers and officers of the Russian army, but their, how they, what they did to being uh, not in war. Uh, if you specify, I could probably address this, but uh, that was not the goal and that was not the question of my study. Okay, okay, good. Thank you. Very, very fascinating uh, discussion. Um, good questions, everybody. I also thought we would uh, move on to uh, some of the other studies as well. Uh, what, uh, here's another uh, question from Jenna. What are the criteria for evaluating creative and non-creative uh, Russian students. I also had a similar question. Um, could you, uh, that, that's for Maria. Maria, could you please expand on that? Um, how do you yeah, th th thank you for the two? question. Uh, though, actually, the time was quite limited, so I didn't mention it in the presentation. Uh, but as I said uh, before, uh, this study was like continuation of the previous one in order to clarify the results. So uh, less creative and more creative students were defined uh, via the level of uh, the, the, the grade that they get on creativity test on the previous study. Uh, they didn't measure creativity again as uh, there was a very small amount of time between two measurements, between two studies. Uh, but in the previous uh, study, the creativity was measured with the help of uh, instrument, 
uh, many instances game that's uh, let it say a task on creative thinking from uh, Mark Runko battery per cup so for cre creativity assessment wow. tests and it contains uh, free tasks in order to well, the respondent should create uh, different instances of particular category. For example, they got an example. Uh, oh, they got they, they got the word like create as much instances as you can, uh, round shape. So they provided different 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 words, and we assessed their fluency, how many answers they gave, how many relevant answers they they gave. Uh, they assessed their flexibility, how many they subcategories of these answers uh, we could we could find there like for example they could say that round can be a planet or they could say that round can be a plate and these are two different categories uh, and the third variable here was uh, originality originality was assessed uh, by the frequency of uh, answers so if uh, the answer respondent gave uh, was uh, was met less than in five percent of all all the answers for all the sample uh, it was decided to be calculated as original one and we get we got latent variable for creativity and uh, like build, build the ratings so we get a list of all respondents from the less creative to the most creative uh, also there was a question in previous study for for respondents whether they agreed to participate on the interviews if if there would be any need to conduct an interviews and among people who agreed to participate in the interviews we we have chosen like the least creative and the most creative from the beginning of the list and from the end of the list 15 people in each group should i clarify um, something more um are there any questions regarding that i think that was quite clear thanks thanks you thank you for clarifying that maria um Unless there are any other questions regarding that topic, uh, we also have questions about uh, Turkish immigrants. Um, I also have a similar question, actually. Uh, can this is from uh, I think Kate? Uh, can your findings on Turkish immigrants um, generalize to Moscow? Uh, so outside of Moscow, can they generalize to other cities in Russia, to Saint Petersburg, to the regions? Because Moscow is obviously a very different uh, kind of a city compared to uh, the rest of Russia. So wondering maybe, Sayer, if you could clarify that. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Thank you for your questions. Yeah, I heard such questions. It can be generalized, actually. Even in the small cities, when I talk with Turkish immigrants from small cities, in the process of data collection, I've met with many, many Turkish immigrants here and from small cities, people say that yeah, it's they they feel themselves more free, more quickly um, adapted, adapted, you know, because they said, yeah, it's a small city. We feel we feel themselves really free. Nobody interfere like our beliefs. Nobody question about, you know, um, our religion and so on. Yeah, it can be generalized to Russia. So even though the quality of life in some of these other cities is quite different and maybe some of their uh, experiences with meeting foreigners is also quite different, you believe that it can be generalized to other cities in Russia as well? I mean, people from Turkey, when, uh, as I say that, it's um, based on migration. Uh, sorry, ba based on work, like, yeah, contract-based migration, especially mm -hmm. engineers and, like, um, technicians. And, I mean, they did not go to a, a small city uh, without no reason. You know, uh, they, they go there, they go to the Siberia, like to somewhere unknown city, small city, by, but uh, they know the results. They, they take the deal. Uh, they have high salaries and they know it. Um, they, they've married with Russians. They raised the kid here, got the citizenship. I mean, yeah, they have good conditions. They know the deal. Right. Great. Thank you for clarifying that. Very helpful. Uh, let's have a look at some other questions. I also have a question uh, from Kate about why did I choose 
these four countries for my little report. Um, uh, well, partly, Kate, it was because of convenience. Uh, I have colleagues uh, in those countries, so I, but there's also a rationale for that because I wanted to get a country uh, in each, well, in some of the different continents. So we have Japan for Asia, we have Russia for Europe, uh, kind of. We have uh, Australia as well, and then we have Canada for North America. That was one of the, the reasons, and partly it was also convenience. Whoever, whoever answered my email, um, so basically, that's one way you can do a study really quickly is offer uh, co-authorship to your participants. Um, and uh, no, they were really great. They really helped me with that. Uh, but again, this is a very preliminary qualitative report. And we have to follow this up with quantitative research. So your other question is, you know, can you clarify if there were cultural uh, specific types of physical uh, symptoms? hard to do at this point. Um, I don't think we have enough data on that, uh, but I think that's a really good question because there is a, a lot of research on cross-cultural differences in terms of how people express symptoms of depression. For example, people tend to somatize uh, symptoms of depression in uh, parts of Asia, while in Western countries, there's a tendency to talk, to talk about psychological symptoms of depression, such as sadness, hopelessness, and so on. While in some parts of Asia, people talk more about somatic symptoms, like feeling uh, feeling pain in their bodies, for example, and uh, or feeling uh, heartaches and and so on. So that still needs to be done uh, in in future uh, research, especially in quantitative research. Thank you for that question. Um, so good. I also have a uh, a question for for Daniel. Uh, Daniel, hopefully you're there. Uh, my master's student, Daniel, are you there? I just have a question for you. Yes, I can hear you. Uh, oh, great, great. Uh, just, I uh, just thought you could maybe update uh, the audience and us, because Daniel's actually also doing uh, a study in Kazakhstan. And I don't know if you, if you could tell us a little bit more about that, because I know that you've, um, you've collected similar data in Kazakhstan. And I mean, based on your preliminary impressions, I know that you still have to conduct the analyses, but are there any differences uh, that you've you've noticed, say, with Russia, with Australia, with Kazakhstan, or any any interesting findings within the group itself? Maybe you could also expand on that. Mm. It's it's a little bit hard to comment just yet on the Kazakhstani data for a few methodological reasons, as well as just um, I need to get, go move further into the analysis. But uh, first off, the sample is quite uh, quite different as opposed to it being a convenient sample in uh, Russia and Australia. Uh, in Kazakhstan, it was uh, primarily just from one university, um, so it's uh, it's probably more indicative of um, the students at that university, um, which is which is one of the uh, premier universities in in Kazakhstan. So arguably, it's a little bit more international uh, and might not be purely uh, Kazakhstani um, individuals. But um, in terms of the findings that I saw, um, there were really mixed results when I looked over. Um, the analysis uh, specifically, um, there would there could be um, some evidence um, of differences in levels of trust in Kazakhstan, um, but I still uh, I was unable to see whether or not uh, depression valuation was um, different there um, as as yet. So there w there wasn't e evidence to say um, that it was that Kazakhstanis rated depression less or more positively um, than than Russia. Um, for example, I, I believe that most of the findings will be closer towards Russia. Um, and the only thing that was was quite conclusive uh, was um, stigma in that um, Kazakhstani did tend to show more evidence of stigma. So they would um, believe that people could snap out of it, um, more likely to be due to immoral lifestyle. Those things were um, certainly more conclusive. But um, as I said, a lot more analysis needs to be done. Great, thank you, Daniel. Um, also, because I think we, you know, we also uh, the study with Karina that we did a couple of years ago. We also found that Russians, compared to Americans at the time, were reporting uh, more, um, were attributing depression more to an immoral lifestyle as well. So that's that's also interesting. But you had a slightly different finding in your study. Um, yeah. yeah, that's correct. I think. Um... I, I believe it's uh, mainly due to changing attitudes over time. Um, I think the more that um, there is a globalization of mental health, um, predominantly from the US or the scientific approach towards understanding mental disorders, 
um, we'll start to see these attitudes changing. Uh, and I think one of the first things that might change is away from mental disorders being a supernatural or religious phenomenon towards being a medical phenomenon, in, in which case that it's not surprising that the younger generation compared to the older generation view depression um, as the latter instead of the former. So they believe that it's due to um, more biological reasons um, and less to do with, you know, the morality of your lifestyle um, compared to older generations. Great. Thank you. Thank you very much, Daniel. Um, so we still uh, have another five minutes left or so. Are there any other questions for the uh, presenters? Any other comments? Now, I would like to uh, let you know, because I, I we did, um, if you go to the top of the meeting chat, we actually started a little uh, survey. Uh, you'll see uh, Svetlana Zaremba. She uh, posted uh, a link to a survey on the pandemic and on quarantines. And if you could do that, that would be great in the next few minutes. There's just, they're just four or five items. You can even share that with the group afterwards. Because we are actually in a very um, unusual time, as I mentioned, uh, this is definitely a historical uh, marker for humanity. We've never actually had this kind of experience before, where we, you know, we're seeing like more than half of the population on the planet being locked down to some extent. So this is um, just just a little survey. I'm just wondering what people's opinions are, what their thoughts are about that. Uh, also, how it's affected your mental health, your physical health. Um, and we could have a mini discussion if people complete that. So it's at the top. Uh, I don't know if people see it. Uh, it's www.menti.com forward slash and a bunch of uh, numbers and letters after that. Um, and I don't know if Sutlan is here. Sutlan, are you here? Has anybody done the survey? If not, um, I also wonder if there are any other questions for any of the uh, presenters. Uh, Thomas, I'm here, and um, so shall I start the story? Because we need to uh, like collect two people, and then I should uh, start the quiz then. Okay. Yeah, sure. And while we're we're just doing that, I mean, I. Um, and you should I use your phones. Yes. No, I. I don't see anybody actually, so. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, okay, that's too bad. I was hoping to get some data from just it's it's really <laughs> maybe, maybe later. Your, your opinion, really your opinion. Um, but anyway, it's at the top of the link. No, no problem. If, if people don't feel like doing it, that's okay. Of, of course, it's completely voluntary. Um, but we had some interesting, uh, just fun findings with our with our students. So. Um, in terms of uh, the the, the uh, topic, uh, Maria, on uh, creativity, Maria, are you, are you there? Yes, yes, I'm here. Right, mm -hmm. I'm just the one because I mean, creativity is such a so it, when the way you measure, you sort of explained how you measured creativity. Um, how is that? An, how is that also related to other, you know, cognitive functions that we might, you know, we, we talk about, such as things such as like executive functions and uh, other forms of, uh, you know, emotional reasoning, um, other sort of phenomena. So how do they overlap, and how how is creative uh, creativity unique? Because I think it's a fascinating topic. Just wondering if you could talk about the construct a little bit more as well. I know you talked about the measurement, but maybe you can talk about the construct too. No, I agree because there are so many approaches to study creativity and to personalize it. Uh, though in this particular study, I used, uh, let it say, the cultural approach to, to create the methodologic, uh, the theoretical basis. But measurement was done mainly on cognitive approach. So in cognitive approach, creativity perceived to be like uh, the not the trait, but particular cognitive ability. And it lies on uh, different cognitive processes, such as uh, like creation of different ideas and uh, mm -hmm. choice of the best ideas. So these are the two main processes that underlie the creativity in this approach. And the methodology is uh, the it, it uh, makes an accent on, I think, the first part of these cognitive processes. So uh, how much ideas do you create? 
uh, how many categories, types of ideas do you create? And whether these ideas are really novel or they are not novel. So whether they are original or not original. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh -huh. Great. Thank you for, for clarifying that. Um, I also uh, uh, have a question for for Kate uh, Koja. Can you tell us, Kate, because I think you have, you mentioned some of your personal experiences uh, with the um, uh, with Crimea and some of your personal connections. Can you talk about maybe how that influenced your, your research? I don't know if you've heard me, Kate. Uh, yes, uh, yes, I'm here. Uh, the thing is, I was born there and I spent my childhood years in Crimea and I had some uh, also school experiencing there until ninth grade. So what I can say that, uh, yes, the Ukrainian education system was quite successful in terms of this raising patriotism. And I think that uh, for Crimean Tatars, that for younger generation of Crimean Tatars that uh, created the very strong ties towards the state. And uh, yes, and uh, about how I see this ethnic group in general, from my personal experience, uh, the study confirms, uh, is in line with the experience that this ethnic group is quite uh, not very close, quite uh, eagerly integrating into society, but very much concentrated on uh, uh, own et ethnicity and uh, puts very much value on uh, ethnic and cultural heritage. Uh, so that's what I noticed while being there, being part of that society. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So very much in line with, with your study findings as well. Yes. Great. Thank you very much for clarifying all of those uh, questions, everyone. So some really great questions from the audience, um, uh, really thought-provoking discussion. Uh, so I think we're out of time now. I think we're supposed to be ending at uh, 1.45 p.m., which is now. So I bid you all good well, uh, good health and stay well and uh, hope to um, see you maybe in the next session. OK, take care, Th everyone. Thomas, by the way, by the way, people voted, some people voted. So I'll um, download the results and I'll put them here somewhere in the chat. OK, OK, you can put the results in the chat. Thank you very much. Stefan. That's yes, great. Okay. So share okay. that with in the chat. But we'll probably just have to end the meeting for now. So unless there are no other comments or questions, I'll um, Maria, do we end the meeting now? Uh, yeah, I think so. We should end this session and another session will start at half past two. Oh, OK, so we have a brief break. Yeah. OK, thank you. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you all Take for care. the participation and for your interest in studies. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thank you, everyone. Please.